The spring day in 1464 was bright and fair as Edward IV, England's first Yorkist king, rode with the hunt in Whittlebury Forest. Whether his thoughts lay on the quarry, the weather, or the tumultuous times that had brought him the crown, they were soon to be caught by another matter entirely. For there, standing beneath an oak tree, stood the most beautiful of women. A small boy clutched in either hand as she watched him approach. Without hesitation, she threw herself into his path, pleading with the king to intercede in a matter that would rightfully restore the dower lands and keep her family from poverty. In that moment, the king was struck, not by the earthly arrow of the hunt, but by the arrow of love, a spell from which he would never be released. That he wanted her there and then, there was no question, and none other before now had resisted the handsome young monarch. He could not, however, persuade the vision of loveliness to concede to so much as a kiss. And when there was talk of taking what he desired by force, her protestations regarding her virtue and her honour so shamed the king that he fell on bended knee before her, swearing eternal devotion. So besotted was the king that he proposed marriage and the pair were married secretly a short while later, much to the shock and consternation of the king's council and subjects alike. So goes the popular legend of how the charismatic and womanising King Edward IV met, married and bedded Elizabeth Woodville, the woman for whom he was willing to give everything. One tantalising question always remains. What was it that made Edward so ready to risk both earthly and heavenly condemnation in order to make Elizabeth his? The answer, according to one theory, is simple. Edward's commoner queen snared and held her man, not just through womanly wiles, but through the more sinister and assured method of witchcraft. The first rumblings of this accusation came in 1469 and did not involve Elizabeth directly, but her mother, Jacqueta of Luxembourg, the former Duchess of Bedford. It was a perilous time for the family. Jacquetta's husband and son had been executed on the order of Edward Earl of Warwick. While Elizabeth and her children were uncertain as to their own future safety, Edward IV himself could offer no help held prisoner by Warwick, the man who had helped put him on the throne. In the midst of the turmoil, a man named Thomas Wake came forward and accused Jacquetta of witchcraft. He had in his possession an image in lead, shaped in the form of a man. It had, he insisted, been made by Jacquetta. Another man, a parish clerk, John, also came forward, corroborating the fact that Jacquetta had also made two further images, one of each of the king and the queen. The implication was obvious. Elizabeth's mother had used the images and her magical knowledge to bind the king and her daughter in an unnatural fashion. Jacquetta was arrested and taken to Warwick Castle. The entire matter stank of political intrigue and manipulation. They had trifled with the wrong woman, however. Jacquetta called on the support of the Mayor of London. The case swiftly fell apart, and the King was once more his own person in January 1470. Determined to clear her name, Jacquetta accused Wake before the King's Council 
of having malicious intentions towards her and, in face of her spirited defence, was acquitted. Any further connections between the Woodville family and witchcraft remained the stuff of whispers until 1483, after the unexpected death of Edward IV in April of that year. The accusation of witchcraft once again reared its ugly head, with Jaquetta, Warwick and Edward all dead however, the new target was Elizabeth herself. Her accuser, none other than Richard Duke of Gloucester, Edward's brother, had seen his chance to ascend the throne and he was determined to overthrow the power-hungry Woodfills once and for all. The story goes that Richard arrived in good spirits to a council meeting, only to abruptly leave the room a short while later. Upon his return, his manner was much changed, and with a flourish, he pulled back his sleeve to reveal his arm, declaring it badly withered and accusing Elizabeth. That sorceress, he called her, of causing his affliction. Not only that, but the Dowager Queen had accomplices, one of whom was Jane Shaw, the best known, and it was said, best loved, of Edward IV's many mistresses. It was said that Edward was already betrothed to Lady Eleanor Butler, and therefore his marriage to Elizabeth was invalid, and the children of the union illegitimate. Second, and the part that has gripped the popular imagination in the years that followed, the accusation was made that the marriage was invalid because it had been brought about by unnatural means by Elizabeth and her mother, Jaquetta. Passed on the 23rd of January, 1484, the act didn't mince words. The marriage was referred to as ungracious and pretended, and by which the order of all political rule was perverted. On the witchcraft count, however, little evidence was actually given. Only the rather vague assertion that it was the common opinion of people throughout the land. The political ramifications of the act were apparent. Richard assumed power, any claims to the throne of the former Queen's children squashed once and for all. Despite this, Elizabeth didn't find herself before the courts. There was no need for the new king to push matters any further. His point had driven home loud and clear. Could there, however, be any truth in the claims of her enemies? Although it seems outlandish and unbelievable to modern sensibilities, love magic was widely practiced and believed in during 15th century Europe and beyond. And it must be remembered that belief in magic was a staple, a belief as that of religion and Christian God. In 1471, for instance, talk of enchantment entered the tale again, as on Good Friday, Edward IV rode out to meet the forces of the Earl of Warwick for what was to prove the deciding battle in the ongoing conflict between the two former allies. The descending fog was said to be so thick that it could not have come from any natural source and therefore must have been brought about by witchcraft and enchantments. Witchcraft was a particularly lethal accusation to make it was one of a small amount against which a uh, woman's rank offered scant protection. Joan of Navarre, the Dowager Queen of Henry IV, was imprisoned, albeit briefly, on accusations of witchcraft in 1419. 
Then there was the large scandal attached to Eleanor, Duchess of Gloucester, who found herself performing humiliating public penance before being subjected to life imprisonment, all because she had allegedly procured the services of a woman to make the Duke marry her and also dare to have the King's horoscope drawn up to see if the Duke, who was the heir of Henry, would one day be king. Although matters did not go that far in Elizabeth's case, both she and her mother would have been chillingly aware of the potential consequences of a link between their name and witchcraft. Looking at the evidence, however, it was unlikely indeed that there was any truth in the accusations against Elizabeth and Jaquetta. Much has been made by some writers of Jaquetta's background and the family legend of the descent from the mythical water spirit, Melisena. It was thought this connection, some say, that Jaquetta and her daughter inherited their innate talent for witchcraft. Witchcraft, after all, was believed to run in families, passed down from mother to daughter across the generations. An idea that was likewise prevalent in the future witch trials of England. There is scant evidence, however, that either Jaquetta or Elizabeth held much stock in the family legend and the fact of its existence is not evidence in itself that they considered capitalising to enhance their prospects. Likewise, it has been asserted that Elizabeth and Edward were married on the first of May, traditionally known as Beltane. It marks one of the most important dates of the pagan calendar and is deeply linked to the popular consciousness with witchcraft and ritual. There are even some accounts that have the king himself joining in the unearthly frolics, coveting away the night before his marriage with Elizabeth, her mother, and their fellow witches. This is, of course, pure fabrication. With the seeming suddenness and unexpected nature of the king's marriage, along with the less than positive response to the identity of his queen, it was perhaps easier for people to believe or to at least mutter about the possibility of mystical means being behind the match. Elizabeth attracted hostility from the start. Her good looks were much envied and combined with her lack of lands and titles, when she came to the king's eye, she was in fact at that point the only queen who had been plucked from the ranks of ordinary subjects to be crowned. She was in a prime position to find herself the subject of rumours and stories. She was also seen by some as a grabbing haughty social upstart, a most unsuitable wife and queen for a king. Her mother was also seen as having too much influence, inspiring her daughter not only to snare the king in the first place, but also to secure positions and marriages for various members of their large family. It is highly unlikely, however, though a good story it might make, that Elizabeth and her mother dabbled in witchcraft. If there was anything other than chance to play, then it was the possibility that Elizabeth was schooled, perhaps by her mother, to wait there that day for Edward to ride past. But there is precious little evidence, even for that level of intervention. The allegations made against both Elizabeth and her mother are best viewed through the political lens of the day. Upon the unexpected death of Edward, there were two main contenders for power and influence. Edward's brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and the Woodville faction, headed by the Queen. 
The Woodville's passed a direct threat to Richard, favouring rule by the whole council. While the young Edward V was in his minority, Richard wanted Elizabeth and her children disarmed and out of the way. As far as Richard's assertions that Elizabeth had withered his arm and stolen his breath, it is hardly surprising that he was unable or unwilling to carry these accusations further. Thomas More dismissed them as rubbish, citing Elizabeth's well-known dislike of Jane Shaw as reason enough to dismiss the accusation of the two women working together. In his opinion, Elizabeth was far too clever to have embarked upon such an unwise course of action as dabbling in witchcraft. Was Elizabeth a witch? The answer from the evidence would have to be no. Whatever one believes, the myth is an enduring and popular one. Here is a love spell that was in use at this time. Honey, one of the sweeter and more palatable ingredients. Honey or mead were often included in medieval love spells. It was expected to influence the object of the seeker's desire favourably towards them and also to sweeten the relationship to follow. It had the added benefit of making the concoction much easier to swallow. Henbane With a sinister reputation both for use by witches and also to deprive a witch of her powers, the herb was also thought to attract love. It could be used to bind a couple together in love and to ensure that the love would last. The ingredient should be used with great caution, however, as it was also known to cause delirium and death. Worms Worms were believed to ensure love between a couple. The suggestion that it be taken with their meat may well have been due to their less than encouraging taste. Worms, due to their obvious link with the earth, were also a potent sign of fertility, a much desired outcome in many love spells. Consecrated Host The power of this vital element of the Holy Communion service was highly prized in the medieval world, making it a much sought after ingredient for a variety of magical purposes including love spells. Difficult to procure, many inventive ways were devised to source a piece, with some resorting to keeping it under their tongue after it had been administered in church. Human remains Powdered bone, hair and blood were just some of the gruesome ingredients a love seeker could be required to provide. One known spell required rather specifically both the bone marrow and the spleen of a murdered boy. Mandrake root Known for its properties as an aphrodisiac as far back as biblical times, Mandrake remained a popular ingredient in love magic throughout the Middle Ages and is still used for that purpose in some areas of the world today. Said to resemble the human form with both male and female plants, the plant was said to shriek when pulled up, causing madness or death to the seeker unless proper precautions were taken. You would mix all of this together in a pestle and mortar and then somehow have the person you desire ingest it. And this concludes the video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please click the like button, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for future videos. Thank you.